You held me in your arms and wiped away my tears. Not even in a million years can I ever repay you for what you've done for me. You were there when I fell, but there was no place for me. You were there to show me how to truly believe in the miracle of creation, in the good and the bad. Oh, how I love you, Mom and Dad. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back. I'm Nadir bin Nasi, founder of OutstandingMuslimParents.com, and here with Huda TV on our episode of Outstanding Parents. Now, of course, this is the zone that we encourage you to be outstanding. We don't think average is good enough, especially when you understand that average is the top of the bottom and the bottom of the top. Okay, so today's episode, we're going to talk about knowing the landscape. And what I mean by that is knowing where you are on the, in the world, especially if you travel. If you immigrate to the West, for example, um, many people don't know the landscape. They come to uh, America thinking that, or the United States thinking that it's just like a, a TV show where they found a land of milk and honey and so on. And this is a very, very dangerous idea because they lose their children, culture, and, and much more. And ultimately, many people lose their dean because they don't know the landscape. So this is what I want you to picture. I'm not sure if you're going traveling somewhere. Of course, if you're going to travel, you need to know the destination that you're going to, of course, how you're going to get there, and what you're going to do when you're there, how you're going to get around. Okay, for example, I'm not from Egypt, but as, when I'm in Egypt, I need to know that I can go where I need to go to get some food. I know that my, my shelter is taken care of and so on, and I'm likely not going to have to figure this stuff out myself. I'm going to ask somebody who lives there how to handle things or some type of tour guide, if you will. So that same thing needs to be done, especially when you move to another country or if you're, you've already immigrated to a country, because knowing the landscape is essential. I didn't know that it would be difficult to even see any type of uh, stoplights or <laughs> anything like that or different traffic um, regulations or lack thereof in different countries until I was actually in it. Now, I consider myself a good driver. I can drive a vehicle and stuff like that where I'm from. However, there are certain countries that I've been to that I'm not getting behind the wheel. There's absolutely no need for me to get behind the wheel if there's going to be somebody else that already knows it. Uh, knows how to drive, knows the culture, knows how to get around in what they're doing. I mean, I, I've been in countries where they drive on the opposite side of the street than, than we do normally. For example, you look at the UK or you look at the Bahamas, for example, instead of driving on the right side of the road, they drive what appears to be like the left side of the road and their steering wheel is on a different side. Well, what does it have to do with raising our children? Pretty much everything. We need to know the landscape so that we know what dangers are there. We know what opportunities also exist so we can take advantage of and beware of the other. Otherwise, we're like, you know, out of our place. We're out of place. You know, we can be pretty much sitting ducks. We don't want to be sitting ducks ourselves, nor do we want our children to be sitting ducks. OK, so this is what I mean. If you're in the United States, there's some essential knowledge you should be knowing about the, your country's history. All right. Now, in the United States, I'll talk briefly about that because that's where I'm from. That's where I was born and raised. My parents were born and raised. I know people ask me, you know, what, where are your parents from, brother? Listen, my parents <laughs> are from the United States. My mother's Puerto Rican. Father was African-American or, you know, black. So my parents were there. You know, we came through the whole slavery thing, you know, to trace our roots back to somewhere would take uh, an immense effort. So, you know, a lot of Allah knows best. And some of you can trace your family directly back where you come from. Well, alhamdulillah, that, that is a blessing. It's the rahmah from Allah for you. So, um, nevertheless, here's the deal. I'll talk a little bit about the U.S.'s history. However, it's important that you also find out the history that, of the country where you were born. The history, period. Any Muslim country, find the history. Let's go back. You know, when did Islam first come to Egypt, for example? When did Islam come through Al Shams? You know, when did Islam spread um, to mid-Africa? When did it get up to Qaqaz? You know, when did this stuff happen? When did it get to Albania, Uzbekistan, and so on? You know, when? Who brought it in? What was, was it a companion? 
what is the tabi you know tabi tabi you know who was it you know what happened you know when it got to turkey and the, the fall of constant uh, constantine and constantinople you know find the history of your country and it's important to understand that but equally or more important especially if you leave your country going somewhere else to know the history of that country so you understand its landscapes its customs its traditions and its games very very important for example talking about the united states when you look at the history of the united states it shows this big you know constitutional founding fathers owing from religious oppression and taxing from king george and you know this big fantasy that's been told however when you look a little bit deeper it's not easy you don't even really need to look deeper you just can actually look at the factual stuff uh, i'm going to talk about two things in specific one is the origins act of 1924. the origins act was a blatantly racist act that was um, passed in the United States that only allowed certain types of Europeans to immigrate to the United States. And it held some as subservient to others and um, inferior, and it was explicit in his racist language in 1924, less than 100 years ago. Oh yeah, racism is still alive and well to this day, <laughs> even though a lot of it is institutionalized, but it's still alive and well. Nevertheless, in 1965, some things had changed with that document. All right, there were some adjustments made due to what happened in 1964 with the, the Civil Rights Movement. Again, these were important and powerful times. Now, 1965 changed the rules from being just Europeans and specific Northern Europeans and Western Europeans and so on and so forth. This explicitly racist document and nobody from Asia or any Muslim country or anything like that was allowed, period, to immigrate. But 1965, after the civil rights era, well, people want to connect back home, and particularly black people from the United States. So even though a lot of immigrants don't know this, or they may have um, an interesting attitude or a negative attitude toward black people and general African Americans and whatnot, they, the, a lot of uh, debt of gratitude is owed due to the Origins Act and a lot of what happened in the civil rights era, um, period. All right, must be understood. So 1965, it opened up the gates to non-Europeans to come to the United States. That's why when I talk about immigrants to the U.S., I'm talking usually first generation. They've come, they have their children there, and many of the children are leaving Islam, okay? Because they're brand new to the country, they don't know the history of the country. Maybe a lot of immigrants don't even know the language um, with which to facilitate. So they say, hey, you know, I'm coming here basically, put my children in a Muslim school, they'll be okay. But they don't know that a lot of things going on in Muslim school go on in non-Muslim schools. They don't know that they inadvertently disempower their children with a number of different gadgets and devices. They don't know the landscape. They don't know the history of COINTELPRO or the counterintelligence program that was put out by the FBI. They don't know the history of different assassination of presidents. They don't know about uh, the Federal Reserve banking system and you know how this started in the early 1900s. They don't know about the run up to the depression. Then of course, a lot of agencies that came from that. So it, it's not an easy feat to just have a class of, hey, welcome to America. Here's its history in a, in a nutshell. No, it's, it's a lot deeper than that. It's important though, when you come over as a non-European immigrant, even if you're a European immigrant, let's say from Albania or Spain or Italy even, well, the thing is that know the country's history. Know what happened when um, Eastern Europeans came in and what happened with the programs they had for assimilation and bringing them into society versus what they didn't do for uh, children of former slaves or descendants of slaves. Look at the black codes. I mean, there's. Uh, laws that were just so racist, blatantly racist, and it's still law, still considered legal, still considered okay, and by the book, okay? So, it, I mean, it's really, really a sad history, but it's important to understand it, because once you understand the history, you still see these remnants of racism, you still see these different seeds, but you know how to work within that landscape. And you also can relate to other people, because when you come to America, for example, and we come with, you know, the idea that um, Islam belongs to a certain group of ethnic individuals, let's say even um, Arabs, for example. Well, Islam belongs to a lost one of the islands for Muslims. It's for all of human beings, but the Muslims own Islam. So Islam, I say, la ilaha Allah, alhamdulillah, now nah, I'm Muslim. You know what I'm saying? So it does not matter. We're bonded by our aqidah. So Muslims in the Caucasus who are white in the Caucasus mountain area or mid-Africa who, who may be dark. We're brothers, we're bonded by our aqidah of Islam. And with that being said, we can't come with the superiority complex or this classism without being sinful. 
Let me put that in there because many Muslims come with it, but we can't do it without being sinful. But knowing the history of the country, you see the separation and division. I see it to this day when I notice different commercials on television really don't feature many black men as though it's a, um, you know, it's not going to sell a product when the black man tends to be one of the most imitated men on the planet, you know, for good or for bad. It is what it is whether it be for dress or for music or whatever celebrity or coming through um, this whole slavery thing and coming out the other end, you know, knowing the landscape of the country, again, is very important. Or we come with just the, the notion that everything's okay. I'm going to go and it's milk and honey out here and people are nice and they're great and they're good to go. Well, in general, how do you human beings in general are, general are nice. You know, we have many things in common, you know, but it's not um, in the benefit of certain institutions and so on to have us unified as one. Division is powerful for some. So hence we have these different borders. You know, it's very interesting because there's not really a term for a convert or revert in the early days of Islam. They didn't use that. A person who was a Muslim or was a not Muslim or was a non-Muslim. So these different new terms are important. When we talk about immigrant, well, Muslims didn't really need uh, visas and passports to travel from mid-Africa to the Caucasus. There was, there was no need for it because you were a Muslim. That was your only passport that you needed. So you, we look at different Muslim travelers that traveled the Muslim world, traveled all over the place, and really learned from different cultures and were able to benefit as historians. SubhanAllah, they didn't have these restrictions we have now. So when we go to airports, we see certain countries have to pay this transit tax and so on. It becomes very challenging. But when we understand the Origins Act, when we understand what's going on with the counterintelligence program and spying on people, and now there's drones flying over the U.S., now there's um, assassinations going on of American citizens by their own government, we have to understand where it's rooted. And the sooner we do that, the better. And inshallah ta'ala, we'll talk about some different techniques and some different things that have been going on um, that is necessary to know in the U.S., inshallah ta'ala, especially when it comes to understanding the landscape. So stay tuned, inshallah ta'ala. We'll be back in just a few moments. Oh, how I love you, mom and dad. Bake Allahumma la bake. La bake Allahumma la bake. La bake Allah. And then to say that life comes out of an accident, where did life come from? Take a few minutes yourself, visit the website that we've got called Face Islam, and look for your opportunity to get the free Quran. Whether you want to read it online or we can send you one, I would love for you to explore what the Quran tells us about the afterlife, the akhir. Listen to this. I was shocked when I heard this, but it does make sense that Allah is going to start the fire of hell with Muslim scholars who preached it but didn't really live it. They were called munafikin, that means hypocrite, one who says it but they don't mean it and they don't do it. The best thing about drinking is to stop. And how about this? Don't start in the first place. Bismillah, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi Welcome back. So alhamdulillah, we talked about the importance of understanding the landscape. Now, I also want to share with you a few other things that you may not know about the landscape of the United States in particular. And I want to talk about the education system. Now, academics are important. To understand things is very, very important. And get the fundamentals, especially whether, you know, math, reading, mathematics. These or Mathematics is math. I don't have to double, I just say it twice or, you know. That's how I was teaching a lesson, but I wasn't. Anyway, <laughs> nevertheless, um, the, re the reading, writing, mathematics, stuff like that, the fundamentals are crucial. However, our dean is more important, is more important. So I'm not saying you just study dean and don't study the, the, the fundamentals and facts. Yeah, you get the fundamentals and facts. That doesn't take long to get, but the schooling system must be understood. Academics is important, not at the expense of your dean. OK, they can both work very well together without an issue. Matter of fact, Islam is the reason uh, scholarship has come in the field of academics. All right. Mathematics with the 
the knowledge of sifat or, or zero, and we still to this day use Arabic numerals. The word chairman or algebra and chemistry and these words, this all comes from Islam, alhamdulillah. So it's not an issue whether or not academics can roll right with the dean. That's, that's a part of the dean. The dean encourages that knowledge, okay? But when we try to separate it, especially in the West because it's they believe in, then there's a challenge. Now, the Western system of education, though, is based on the Prussian system. And if you know about that system, the system was designed to do two things very well and succeeded. The first thing is to create very obedient, good workers. Good workers. Obedient, good workers. The second thing was to create soldiers. Yeah, soldiers. So the Prussian system that the U.S. system is based off of was good workers, soldiers. Hmm. So now is there any surprise why you see uh, the GI Bill? Hey, come to the military. We'll pay your school and, you know, come over here, sacrifice your life, and we'll do this? Uh, based off that Prussian system. Now let's go back uh, almost about 100 years with the implementation of the system in the United States at the um, Industrial Revolution. There was a, a big steel magnate, uh, multi-millionaire, billionaire, um, Andrew Carnegie. And what Carnegie's plan was, was when he built these steel factories, he built them around towns, okay? Now, with the towns, it's very interesting when you think about this. He had bells, ringing bells, that ring bells that let his workers know when to go on break. Well, as they designed the school system, Rockefellers designed the school system, at, and I believe even the General Education Board or something like that, that still exists even to this day by the Rockefellers. Interesting, right? But they designed it, the school and the towns and so on, around the whole factory setting to create good workers. So now in school, when it's time to change period, you'll hear a bell or an alarm that goes off. So it conditions the child, up, oh, boop, it's time to move to the next class. On your job, boop, time to go to break. So there's the same type of conditioning that's been going on for almost 100 years. Now, very few people even think about it. It's just a natural progression as part of someone else's plan. So it built the steel factories and stuff around these towns for the purpose of employing these individuals when they got out of school to go ahead and make this steel company more money. Not necessarily you know, a bad plan when you look at it, when you look at it from an entrepreneurial perspective. However, we must be aware and cognizant of that plan so we don't fall prey to it. How many people feel like they're hamsters on a wheel to this day? People working 40, 50, 60, 80 hours or whatnot per week to try to take care of their family don't feel like they're getting anywhere, and many are even sacrificing their dean in the process. So it's important, again, to understand where this comes from because the sooner we understand where it comes from, we could devise a plan to make sure we don't fall into that trap. So again, academics are important, and surely that's what caused um, the, the explosion of academics. Islam is what caused it. Muslims are what cause it in their pursuit of knowledge. So alhamdulillah works. Now, since it's based off the, the Prussian system, keep in mind, we talked about the workers. Then, of course, you have the soldiers. How many people come out of school, decide, look, they don't want to go to college or university. They want to go ahead and they, they don't know what to do, so they want to go to the military. So they have a, a sense of acceptance. Now, why is this important? Because we put our children into these schools that are still part of that same system. I was talking to a brother. Um, maybe a couple of months ago. And I, it, it was a hard conversation to even have because he's not from here. First generation, just like I talked about, due to the Origins Act of 1965. Well, his daughter's about to go to college. And the college she's going to is out of town. And it's also known as one of the top five party colleges in the country. And some of you already know what that means. Well, it's a, it's a party college. So they go there and have fraternity parties, sorority parties, drink a lot of alcohol, have all kinds of illicit sex, and so on and so forth. That's the type of party that's going on at this university. I know this. I'm from here. Brother doesn't know this. So the brother's contemplating whether or not to let his daughter go to this college that she really wants to go to. All right, he was having reservations about it because he wants to, he wants to protect his family. But he knows his daughter's getting older, she wants some independence and stuff like that. And he's hoping he could trust her. Well, unfortunately, mother goes, went back home for a little while and stuff like that. But unfortunately, when the mother was gone, then the daughter decided to um, go out and take off the abaya and stuff like that in public and didn't know that she was going to be seen by other Muslims, other Muslims, for example. So I had a hard conversation with the brother because 
you know, you feel you could trust your, your children, you feel you could trust your daughter, but there were some things that didn't happen ahead of time or she fell prey to her peer pressure group and took off the clothes. Now, okay, beautiful children, have beautiful, beautiful sons, beautiful daughters. Now, how is that going to be affected going off to college when you're not there, when Umi's not there either? You know, do we think it's going to come and all of a sudden she's going to find her dean more? Or is it likely that we're feeding her to the wolves and, and just hoping for the best that she's not going to come back pregnant or maybe she's not going to go to a party and so on? Again, we have to be strategic and we have to be intelligent about this. We can't be naive. We all want to trust our children. Yes, well, alhamdulillah, we should want to trust our children. But at the same time, we can't be naive as to what's going on around us. This college is a party college. It's likely that she's going to be going to these different parties. The friends and company she keeps are not people who have hayat. They're not people that are even really Muslim like that. So, again, if I'm looking at an estimated outcome of what's to happen, I want to do what's best for my family. I want to follow Allah to Allah's order. says, save yourself and your family from the fire whose fuel is men and stones. I have to make a decision. <coughs> Excuse me. That is based on my reasoning and rationale, but if I don't know the landscape, then I just hope for the best and see what happens. And hoping for the best and seeing what happens is not a good thing to do, especially when you um, don't know any better or maybe you're not trying to learn. If you're just hoping for the best, what is that? You know, if I go to sleep hoping to just go ahead and wake up, you know, for Salatul Fajr, no, I have to make this my intention before I go to sleep is to wake up on time, offer Salatul Fajr and be good to go. You know, I'm not hoping for the best during Ramadan when it's time to fast. Oh, I hope I'll fast. I hope it'll be okay. No, I have to make my intention, my niya, and do what I need to do and prepare properly. Again, we talk about proper preparation. And, you know, preparing properly means you've looked at it, you thought about it ahead. I mean, this is the Muslim. We talk about Muslims being disciplined. When it comes time for Salah and it's Ramadan and all these things that we have to do when it comes to dress and covering ourselves properly in the outer and so on, we have discipline. So we must be that more vigilant, especially when our children are in the same school system that's pulling towards workers and pulling towards soldiers. And the college years is even said kind of tongue in cheek. It's not said with, hey, that's where I got my education and stuff from and that. Now, True indeed, many Muslims have gone in and come out, alhamdulillah, well, you know, without much of, much of a problem. They've been exposed to a number of different things, but alhamdulillah, they passed the test. However, you have to know your child. You have to know the environment they're going into. You have to know what's been put, up, put in them at home and the seeds they have. Now, of course, they're accountable. By the time somebody's going to college and, and university or whatnot, they are definitely accountable, 100%. But I know it's better to have missed a catastrophe than to have to go through a catastrophe and be patient. So may Allah Ta'ala make it easier for us to spot these things, to understand the landscape. One of the places to easily check things out is, all right, well, let's go to um, <clears throat> talk about COINTELPRO or let's talk about the Black Panther movement or the MOVE organization. Let's talk about the history of pharmaceuticals. Let's talk about mind, mind altering drugs. These things can be looked up easily. Let's, let's see how they still to this day for women prisoners in the United States, which is like more than any women prisoners throughout the planet, give birth in change shackled. You know, I mean, subhanAllah, very inhumane, very inhumane, still shackled to the bed and having to give birth like that. That's crazy. But look at the history and know where you're at so that you can take the proper actions in advance. That is what distinguishes people that are outstanding Muslim parents versus those who are just average or below average. Again, we want you to be outstanding. We want you to take action on these strategies and make sure you're moving in the right direction, the direction that you want to go, where you want your family to achieve more and be more and, of course, be outstanding. So what we're going to encourage you to do, of course, is go to outstandingmuslimparents.com slash education, outstandingmuslimparents.com slash education, get the worksheets, follow along with what we have, and check out the different resources, inshallah, and may it benefit you and your family, and we strive all upon Sarat al-Mustaqim. With that, we appreciate you being here, remind you that a wish changes nothing, but a decision changes everything. I'm Nadir bin Nasib, signing off for outstandingmuslimparents.com. Jazakumullah wa khair. Wa salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. While my world was crumbling down and you tried your best to shelter me from the coming of the storm.
You opened my eyes to see that all hope was not gone. You held me in your arms and wiped away my tears. Not even in a million years can I ever repay you for what you've done for me. You were there when I fell, but there was no place for me. You were there to show me how to truly believe in the miracle of creation, in the good.